Welcome to the Newton tutorial series. I'm Mike Cruz with AC Tech, and in this tutorial we're going to continue our discussion of setting up movement for your layers in the geometry window. So in the last tutorial we talked about, the last few tutorials we talked about velocity control and basic layer movement, but now we're going to uh, touch a little bit on linear and rotational cyclic motion. So I'm going to import a geometry here. I've got sort of a screen or a grate. And let's say I wanted to vibrate that up and down or left and right or however I wanted to do that. So in order to set that up, we first want to go to the layer that we want to vibrate. In this case, I'm just going to vibrate that green mesh. So the screen. So in order to set up your cyclic motion, you still enter values in these first two boxes under layer movement. What time do you want to start the cyclic motion? And how long do you want to do the cyclic motion? So we're going to start this at zero this time. And in order to enter a value of zero, you can try to enter zero, but it just comes in blank because Newton reads any null value as zero. So you can just ignore it. But you do need to enter a moving time still. So we'll say moving time of 10 seconds. Now to do your cyclic motion, you also have to enter your cyclic time, the time for one complete cycle. So in the case of linear motion, one complete cycle is a full back and forth motion, or up and down. That's one full cycle. In the, t in, in the case of uh, rotational motion, one complete circle or one complete ellipse is one uh, rotation. So if I know that the frequency of this is, say, 10 hertz, then obviously my cyclic time will be 0 .0, uh, 0 0.1. But uh, we'll speed it up a little bit faster than that. We'll do 0 0.08. Now, how do I want to move this? For the sake of simplicity, maybe we'll just go ahead and move it up and down in the z direction. But all you really need to do here is for your cyclic displacement, that's for your linear cycle and you just enter, well, how far do we move in the, in the x, y, and z direction. So what it does is it, it'll, take a, it'll assume that, that the, the initial location of this layer, that that's the starting position. So if you enter a positive or negative displacement, it'll move relative to that initial position. So that means we'll just go ahead and say our, our cycle motion is 0 0.02 in the z. I could say negative 0.02, and in that case, it would start moving downward and then upward. But we're going to have it move upward first. So the other thing to keep in mind is if we go back to our general variables page, we had a short discussion in one of the previous tutorials about the directional collision ratio and the moving cell triangle update and the critical time ratio. So if you recall, the critical time ratio is basically a multiplier for the variable time step that helps the, the helps create stability in the stim, in the simulation. So a, a, a practical maximum for this is about 0 0.2, but because I know that you know what, I've got a lot of quick moving surfaces here and the particles are really going to be bouncing around. I want this simulation to be as stable as possible, so I'm going to turn that down to 0 0.15. And certainly, that's going to increase my, my simulation time by a factor of 0.2 over 0.15. So it's going to increase the simulation time by about 33%. But I'm okay with that because I'd rather have a stable simulation. Similarly, the directional collision ratio that was uh, our update factor for how often do we update the grid cells where all of the particles are in. And because these particles are bouncing around chaotically, well, let's just bump that up to, say, 1.5. And the moving triangle cell update, that's how often do we update the cells that all the triangles are located in. And because we know these triangles are moving pretty quickly, well, we don't want to take any chances, and we're going to turn that down to 0 0.2. So the combination of these three factors is going to help give us a very stable simulation for our cyclic motion. Now the last thing to do would be simply to generate some material. Let's just go up like this. Hmm. We'll go, what's my positioning here? 3.5, 1, 2, and 75. So if I go ahead and generate the material, 
Yeah, maybe we want it a little bit further than that, huh? There we go. Okay. So let me do that one more time. What was my... Okay, that's good. So now if we go ahead and run this, and see what we get. Take a side view here. And you can see that we've got our screen moving up and down. You know what? We should do one other thing here. It's kind of tough to see what's going on. Let's go ahead and turn down our, our playback time interval to 0 0.005. So we're going to spit out four times as many frames as we just were make it easier to see what's going on. So we can see it's moving up and down a little bit at a pretty quick pretty quick rate. And that's pretty simple. So I've already run a simulation using these same parameters. I'll just go ahead and pull up the animation from that. And there's really nothing more to it for your linear motion. Just make sure you set those parameters and try and turn up the stability of the simulation by changing that critical time ratio. So now what about if we wanted to do rotational motion instead? Well, let's go back to our geometry. Go back to our screen layer. And these parameters can stay the same. Same moving time. We'll say it's the same cycle time as well. So how do I want to move this? Well, the most uh, obvious choice is moving it in the X and Z direction. So I'll delete my values out of my cyclic, cyclic displacement because we're not doing linear motion anymore. Now we're doing uh, rotational motion. So what I would do is I would enter two values into two of these three boxes. And those represent my um, the axes of my ellipse for my radial motion. Certainly, if, if uh, in the X and Z direction, if I wanted complete circular motion, I would just enter the same value, say, 0.01 and 0.01 and that would move in a circle but maybe I want to do elliptical motion and all I need to do for that is say well let's just change Z to 0.02 and now I'm going to be creating that elliptical circular motion but you know what for the sake of, of being able to show you what's going on let's just exaggerate this let's say 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 now let's uh, turn down our playback file size playback file time a little bit more so we can see what's going on. And let's go ahead and run this. You can see how quickly that moves. Certainly because we're spitting out so many frames the the rendering is taking almost as much time as the simulation here. That's why it's moving so slow. That and the fact that we're moving all these triangles pretty heavily. And of course, what do we think is going to happen right here? It's going to smack into those particles and launch them up into the air. So of course, this isn't a realistic simulation. You don't get this quick, your vibrational motion, when it's just for, for the sake of having fun. We're going faster than 10 meters per second there. So, if we look at our, if we hover over our cyclic radius, we get a little explanation. If you only enter one radius in any of these boxes, it, it can't do a, a cyclic motion because you require both a, a semi-major and a semi-minor axis to do the rotational motion. So if, if you do that, it assumes that perhaps you only want rotational motion about the vertical axis. So it would just assume that you're going to get circular motion about the vertical axis if you do that. And similarly, if you go ahead and enter values in all three boxes, then Newton's just going to use the x and the y value and assume that you want to rotate about that same vertical axis. But of course, all you need to do is make sure you only enter two radii and make sure you enter them in the in the correct boxes. And the same 
discussion that I had regarding your critical time ratio and the directional collision ratio on the moving triangle update. It applies here as well. We want to make sure those values are at reasonable, um, reasonable settings so that we get a stable simulation. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up the animation from this one that I made earlier. Of course, this is that smaller radius, not the large exaggerated one. So the last thing to talk about here is the you, it, it, you cannot combine linear and rotational motion in Newton. I mean, I, I don't even know if any real devices actually combine them anyway. But uh, the point is you can only use linear or uh, rotational. So, And if you happen to enter values in both boxes, if I had my 0 0.02 here again, then it's just going to completely ignore the linear motion and assume you want rotational. Because the rotational motion will always trump linear motion here. So you can only use one or the other, and it's going to assume if you have a value in one of these boxes, it's going to assume that you want the rotational motion, and it's going to totally ignore that 0.02 there. So that pretty much covers the cyclic motion. Uh, one more thing we'll talk about really quick is just the frictional properties here for these layers. So the surface friction is obviously the frictional coefficient for each particular surface that you import. If you recall from the material properties window, you can specify a default surface friction coefficient for your material sets A, B, and C. But if you want, for each specific surface, you could override it with a different friction coefficient. And for each of those material sets, A, B, and C. And similarly, the liquid bridge multiplier. In our material properties window, there was this uh, boundary surface tension multiplier. And that's your default multiplier for liquid bridge against a surface. But if you want, for each layer, you can go, th go ahead and override that multiplier to you know whatever you want. So I think that covers uh, everything I wanted to cover for this tutorial. If you have any questions about your linear or cyclic motion, there should be some more information in the manual, or you can go ahead and send an email to info at Thank you.